right. Um, I'll get started. I um, like to welcome you all to uh, the Sunday seminar, first in the seminar 2018, uh, our third this term. Um, and happy new year, I guess. Uh, it's not too late to uh, wish you all a, a happy 2018. I'm really excited about our seminar today. Our, um, our guest speaker is uh, Dr. Isak Stoddart from the University of Uppsala in Sweden. And, um, and his, he's going to talk to us about his experience being a deputy director of CMUS in Uppsala University, uh, which stands for the Cent which is a center for environmental development studies. And, uh, you know, this is perhaps, it couldn't be more timely, given, the, um, given what's going on in the UK in the higher education sector. And, and his experience is interesting, um, as he would describe to us, the student-driven uh, research and interdisciplinary work in response to the um, problem of environment um, and, and the challenges of climate change uh, that we as an academic sector uh, have to respond, for, respond to uh, effectively. So without further ado, I'll leave the floor to Isa. Thank you, Isa, for that. And uh, if, yeah, are, are you okay with the lighting? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay, that's great. Perfect, yeah. Oh, and um, in case of the fire alarm, uh, the uh, exit is through here, and then follow the green signs out. And um, yeah, the, that's that's all the housekeeping I have to do. Great. Thank you. So thank you so much, Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thank you also, a big thank you to, to Carly and to Amrita and to Kevin Anderson and Alice um, and all your colleagues here at the uh, at Tyndall Center and, and Mace for inviting me to come here. I've been here for about 24 hours and it's been a whirlwind of different meetings and, and it's been, been really great to be here. I've heard so much about this place, so it's really nice to be here. Um, so this is where I'm from. This is Uppsala, uh, a town just north of Stockholm, about 45 minutes north by train. Um, I grew up here, or a little bit outside of the city, um, and before getting in touch with the center that I'm now the deputy director of, I was a student of engineering um, uh, at Uppsala University, studying engineering physics, and I uh, sort of geared my studies more towards the environmental issues and uh, societal futures. Um, but I've called this talk today, or this seminar, and I'll speak for about probably no more than 40 minutes, so I'll give it'll be about 20 minutes for questions at the end, but we'll also have a little bit of an interactive uh, session here as well, so you can't uh, completely get lost in your computers. Uh, I'll, I'll keep you active. Um, and I called this talk uh, from Sweden with care, education and societal change in troubled times. And I guess with care, I'm sort of alluding to two things. One, one is the, the fact that um, I think a lot of the work that I'm involved with right now is is bringing care into and the idea of ethic ethics back into or into context of higher education and thinking about uh, the purpose and role of, of, of education and the role of students in particular in relation to this. But also called it uh, with care in a sense because I have realized uh, it's always good to be careful when speaking in a different uh, cultural and institutional context. So some of the things I'll be telling you about are, are very context specific uh, to, to Uppsala and to Sweden, but perhaps will be interesting to, to many of you here as well in Manchester, even though there are differences, of course, in our higher education uh, sectors that, that hopefully we'll be discussing a little bit today as well. Uh, not least the fact that you that uh, students here pay quite high tuition uh, and in Sweden, uh, education is still free, um, except for people outside of Schengen, of course, which is another issue that we could discuss at length. Uh, and I, I, I've called it, uh, I mean, education is in the other undertitle, but I'll mostly be speaking about higher education, but I think Anywhere where learning takes place, uh, some of the things I'll be bringing up um, will hopefully be relevant to, to other contexts. So I guess before I, I begin my talk, it's always nice to know who I'm talking to. So just very briefly, um, who in here is, is in some way or another affiliated with the University of Manchester? And uh, how many of you are here uh, as, as, uh, as sort of interested public? Always. Okay, great. And how many of you are, are associated to the Tyndall Center? Few, and to the, the school of, uh, I can't remember that acronym, but MACE. MACE. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, and I'm going to start actually with a very short creative exercise. This is something that uh, was inspired partly by an Englishman who came over to, uh, to our university a few months ago called Rob Hopkins. And uh, I'm going to show you a picture. In, in one second, and you're going to have to turn to your neighbor um, 
for one or two minutes and uh, just to find somebody that's uh, sitting next to you. And hopefully uh, some of you are, you know, working at the university, so usually you have a pen or a piece of paper um, or a computer, some of you might have, so that's fine as well. And I'm gonna give you two minutes um, to discuss with your neighbor and come up with as many purposes as you can think of, of what I'm about to show you. So as many purposes or as many uses of what I'm about to show you. And don't worry too much if, if, you, if, if it's right or wrong, or if it's false or true, or if it's something that exists or doesn't exist. This is an exercise in imagination. So just batter away as many purposes and uses as you can uh, for the uh, picture that I'm about to show you. And it represents something, and I'll say what it represents as soon as I show it to you. And then you begin right away. Has everybody found somebody? <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's... You can join us? You can join us. Okay. Can we be group three? Three is fine. <laughs> you might have a competitive advantage or you might not have one. <laughs> so, write down as many purposes as you can think of up for a university. <laughs> oh my god. I won't play. <laughs> okay, I'm going uh, I'm going to start with community hub just to be annoying and use the word hub. <laughs> Okay, nesting site, nesting site, yeah. anchor institution, all <laughs> <Or> day. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> when I mean nesting, I mean birds and bats. Uh huh, yeah, I'm sorry, I had to come straight out with it. <laughs> Great. Uh -huh. I like bats. I like that. Yeah. So it becomes an, an artifact for flowers and birds and bees. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you can use the infrastructure. Yes. <laughs> Uh, a laboratory. Yes. Yeah. yeah, forget all the normal boring things about educating. Yeah. I think we kind of know that that's in free fall, don't we? <laughs> um, uh, it means to have a discussion. Yes. Uh -huh. So, shall I put that with community hub? So it's that idea of sort of uh, a place where you're given formal permission to inquire. I think it should be a centre for sustainability. <laughs> yeah. It should serve the community. Yeah. <laughs> I think a centre for responsibility. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I like. Yeah. Okay, time's up. Sorry, just like an exam. <laughs> um, so don't worry about it. if you didn't get more than a few or if you got many, that's great. Um, how many of you got more than, than five uh, purposes? How many of you got more than 10? Do you? You've got more than 15. No? Oh, um, 10. 10? Cool. So anybody would like to share one, one purpose that you that you found that you think was especially interesting that you'd like to share with you? <coughs> Real or imagined? Uh, it, it is a stunner. What happens in Manchester uh, happens next week in the rest of the world. Oh, okay. Interesting. So that's more Manchester specific then, exactly. Yeah. Well, it says the University of Manchester. That's true, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, a centre for responsibility. Responsibility, okay. Anything else? Keep up with the uh, tech, latest technology. Sorry? Keep up with latest technology. Latest technology, yeah. Yeah, yeah. technological change and being competitive. Yeah, competitive, technological change, yeah. Uh, unifying specialities for climate change mitigation. Mm. Interesting. Yes. A habitat for <laughs> other beings apart from humans. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, mm. that's what it is. Yes. Critical thinking. Critical thinking. Yeah. Mm. So we had bringing people into the city both from elsewhere in the UK and from that city. Okay, very interesting. Internationalization as well. Okay, great. I'm going to cut it there. Uh, but I think there's many interesting, we, we, we could go on like this for the whole seminar, I think. Um, uh, for me, personally, I think this idea of sort of um, 
thinking imaginatively is, is for me also a core part of what a university should be doing more and exercising those muscles more than maybe other muscles sometimes. I spend a lot of time in admin and I feel a bit frustrated sometimes with that. Um, but I think also the critical thinking aspect is, of course, extremely important. And, and, the, and the sort of marriage of these two, I think, is one of the things that, I mean, maybe slightly naively is something that I believe is, is, is part of what a university should, should be doing, at least. And, but I think also, of course, it's important to acknowledge that universities is a very generic term for something that can look very, very differently in different, different cultural contexts and in dis different historical periods. And also that our history affects us as institutions and what we're able and not able to do in some sense, uh, even if we know it or not. And I think I was reading up a little bit um, about uh, history of Manchester uh, in terms of being at the forefront in, in many ways uh, throughout history. Uh, but also the university itself, and I was I was interested uh, to see that um, that uh, the university says that it's it's founded in 1824. But if I'm correct, I, I'm guessing that that's the technical college that was founded in 1824. And then Owens College, if I'm correct, was was uh, was established a few decades later by uh, um, a bequest from a uh, cotton mill industrialist called jo J John Owens. If I'm correct, right? Is that Right. Sounds plausible. Yeah, <laughs> and I think this is this is uh, an artist, one artist rendition of, of what it might have looked like in, in Manchester in the in the eighteen fifties. Uh, I don't know if it's correct or not. It's it's hard for us in this room to tell, maybe. Um, but I think it's it's a it's an interesting combination for me of sort of this romantic idea of you know, this this uh, this group of people having a picnic, and then you have the the have the, the factories in the in the background, and everything looks quite quite nice. Um, and at the same time, more or less, um, this man was hanging around here on planet Earth, uh, probably not in Manchester. Uh, he was he was an Irishman. And um, how many of you recognize this person? A few of you do. OK, maybe more of you should, actually. <laughs> but so who can say who this is? Come on. John Tyndall. That's right. Between 1820 and 1893, and of course, of the inspiration to the establishment of the Tyndall Center, I'm guessing. And I brought him up, not because he's a gray-haired old man from the 1800s, but because uh, he had some interesting ideas, I think, about the role of education that, that I don't know that much about. But he, he called the role of being, or the, up to him being a teacher, he, he's been known to express these thoughts, but it, he knew of no higher, nobler, or more blessed calling than, than being a teacher. I think we probably would have agreed upon quite a few things, but we probably would have disagreed upon a few things as well if, if we'd had a chance to meet each other, which will be clear from my presentation, uh, probably. So in brief, uh, this is what I will try to go through in the next um, uh, half an hour. Um, I'll talk a little bit about education and social societal change in troubling times, the undertitle of the presentation. I'll tell you a little bit about the center where I work and and. Um, as, as an example of an innovation in practice and really the university trying to grapple with how to address our current ecological and social challenges in, in new ways. Uh, I'll then talk a little bit more generically or ge generally about the idea of student-faculty partnership uh, that goes much beyond listening, beyond the idea of listening to the student voice and actually incorporating students much more into the, the, the design and, and thinking about how, how to create um, collaborative learning environments. And there's a lot of research going on in that, so I'll refer to some of that. Um, and that seems, of course, an example of this. That is, is one example. Um, and then at the end, I'll, I'll put some thoughts, perhaps a bit provocative, to, to, for us to sort of kickstart a conversation about the role of the universities in, in grappling with the, the issues that we're faced, um, um, faced with in, in society at the moment. So again, here's another artist that uh, drew this probably a bit earlier than the, 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 the painting from Manchester. Um, anybody know where, where this might be? Morocco? Florence? Good, good, good guess, but what did you Florence? say? Florence? France? No? Florence. Florence. No, uh, it could have been, uh, but it's um, actually Bologna. <laughs> so this is uh, the, the sort of the birth of the the Western university, you could say, because there were other examples of more Eastern universities that sort of are the roots of scholarship today. And what I find interesting with this picture is, of course, you know, the, the, partly the similarities to being in a church. Uh, and uh, secondly, I find it interesting to see that we still design our learning environments uh, quite similarly. Uh, we're sitting in a very 
similar. Uh, <laughs> so some things don't change, but some things do change. Um, and I think it's quite interesting here, you can actually see uh, this person here looks like they're looking at an iPhone <laughs> or having a chat in the back, not really paying attention to what the gray-haired old man is saying in the front. Um, and of course, everybody's taking notes because there was no printing press. So the, the thing that you got from being at the university was actually uh, your notes. That was you know, the, the sort of product that you, that you took with you. What I find a little bit depressing is that uh, this is a picture from our university. Uh, I won't say in which subject field it is. It's not one of our modules. Uh, it's at a different department. Um, but this is what it looks like. It, 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 I think this is quite a, quite a common picture, actually, unfortunately. And uh, I, don't, I don't see many in that picture that paying a lot of attention or thinking that you know university is is is, is a melting pot of, of both critical and creative thinking. This is rather the opposite, at least to me. I think David Orr, the educator from the United States, captures this quite well in his quote, which I'll read out to you. Um, um, and here he talks about also the, the challenges that we're faced with as a society at the moment, specifically the environmental challenges. And he um, talks about that the scientific evidence suggests that the years ahead will test coming generations in extraordinary ways. Educators are obliged to tell the truth about such things, but then to convert the anxiety that often accompanies increased awareness of danger to positive energy that can generate constructive changes. Environmental education must be an exercise in applied hope that equips young people with the skills, aptitudes, analytic wherewithal, creativity, and stamina to dream, act, and lead heroically. To be effective on a significant scale, however, the creative energy of the rising generations must be joined with strong and bold institutional leadership to catalyze the future better than the one in prospect. And David Orr wrote this back in 2009, but it's based on an earlier text that he wrote 20 years earlier. Um, and then, Yet, this is how many of our students are spending their time at university. Is that a picture that goes together? Not for me, at least. And I guess David Orr goes even further and asks the question, or has this theory or this idea that much of what has gone wrong with the world around us is actually the result of inadequate and misdirected education that alienates us from life in the name of human domination and causes students to worry about how to make a living before they know who they are. This is quite a, you know, in some ways provocative, maybe not for others. And I think this is the sentiment in which some of the students coming to Uppsala University back in the early 1990s, two biology students, in fact, felt when they were, they were looking forward to university as, as being this creative and imaginative space where you could learn about the world and also figure out how you could, uh, you could actually be a part of, of influencing things that might not be completely great around us in the world. And, they came to Upsala University and sat in the lecture hall, much the same as you saw earlier, and much the way that we're sitting right now as well, in some sense. Uh, and they were quite disillusioned, actually. Um, but what was interesting was that they decided to do something about it. So they put together a proposal for an interdisciplinary seminar series uh, that they coined, that they called Humanity and Nature, trying to figure out ways in which the university can start addressing the questions that were being discussed at an international level in the the Rio Earth Summit, for example, the same year in 1992. Uh, so they put, put together this proposal and um, they had the fortune of meeting a few, um, at the time, not so old professors. Now they're quite senior. One of them was Ben Gustafsson here, who is a professor of theoretical astrophysics. And with his help, they managed to uh, uh, create a proposal to the vice chancellor uh, that uh, the vice chancellor um, really thought was it was a great idea, and he really liked this idea. It was quite conservative, but he liked this idea of students taking the initiative because it reminded him of the, the roots of the university and Bologna and students organizing themselves and inviting lectures into the university to, to learn things. So he sort of bought this idea, and instead of the students who were just asking to have this type of seminar series delivered to them or, or given to them, they were actually put in charge by the vice chancellor. He said, well, you came up with the idea. You have all the ideas of people who we should invite from different parts of Sweden. I'll sign the letters if you write the invitation letters and I'll give you a small budget to uh, to put together this, the seminar series. And it's great if you produce uh, some form of publication afterwards so we can sort of, you know, make use of this uh, in the future. But make sure to create a reference group of senior academics that can help you guide you in this process. So, so the vice chancellor, I think that was quite an interesting move in a sense to sort of hand over the responsibility to these students that have these ideas. And that's actually shaped our organization ever since. So um, what happened after that is a center was established in 1996 based on this experience from running the seminar series, which was an evening time 
uh, court, uh, evening time module that could be taken by anybody within from any different discipline and also uh, was um, at times also open to the public. And I think 500 students signed up for, for, the first, uh, for the first module with only one month's notice. And there was only the room could only take 200. So they had to you know, decline 300 students. So then the next year they, they could bring them in and then it sort of grew from there. So in 1996, the center was established, as I said, as a joint center between the two universities in Uppsala. Uppsala University, which is, goes back to 1477, and the Swedish Agricultural Science University, which is a, has a campus outside of Uppsala, but also campuses around Sweden. Um, and this is uh, this is uh, um, I guess yeah. So what's interesting is that there was there was an interdisciplinary center that was created, and then about ten years later or eight years later, uh, a research school was established as well, and it was meant to be really interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary, directly sort of. Um, covering all disciplinary domains. So but welcoming students from all different backgrounds, also having researchers and teachers contribute to the center's activities uh, from all sorts of backgrounds, but also uh, outside of the university. So it's sort of a transdisciplinary center in that sense. Um, and I guess what's interesting is that our university such, I think my impression is that Manchester in some sense is, is, is a bit similar to Uppsala University. We have about 40,000 students, uh, 6,000 staff, and a, and a quite siloed university with a lot of disciplines and not so much collaboration or um, um, or activities that go on across those across those scientific domains and that's sort of the sort of gap that we we could fill and that's still what we're trying to do and um, I think this response that these students had is sort of still with us as a sort of zeitgeist uh, and I think that sort of informs a lot of the things that we're actually doing today uh, if we know it or not. Um, and this picture here is, uh, is uh, from the uh, start of the semester sort of event that we had a few years ago in our library. And I, I guess just took the picture there because it shows a lot of a different type of learning that's taking place there than, than in the, the more the, the traditional didactic settings that we're, that we're used to teaching in. Um, so very quickly here, um, what CMIS is today, what the center is today, it's a... It grew out of an educational initiative, so that's still our sort of strong, strongest um, um, base uh, of activities. We have about 20 credit-bearing interdisciplinary modules about environment development and sustainability issues. We have about 30 employees. Uh, many of them are students. Uh, we have about 500 to 600 students annually from 40 plus different countries. And we have about 250 guest lecturers and other external contributors uh, from all sorts of different disciplines that contribute to our, to our modules as lecturers or uh, seminar holders or examiners and so forth. We do have research, uh, an emerging research uh, environment as well. I mentioned the research school that was established in 2002. And then as of three years ago, uh, we have this visiting professorship in climate change leadership uh, that I'm coordinating as well. And, and currently, uh, Kevin Anderson from here from Manchester is the, is the current holder. Um, and we're looking for a replacement soon. So if you're interested, let me know. Um, and then also the third, I guess this is called goal three, I've, I've just been informed. That's interesting because in, 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 uh, in Sweden, we have the same thing. It's called three the uppgiften. So the third task. So it's very similar to so that's this idea of outreach, but also something that goes beyond outreach and, and that we really try to see this as a sort of a, a dialogue process with different actors and, and also trying to create a meeting place both within the university, a physical meeting place, but also an intellectual meeting place um, within the university that also reaches out to society in different ways. And I guess what we do is we reach out to actors that aren't usually in touch with the university, um, um, such as perhaps actors that don't have the financial resources that, that uh, enable some actors to be in quite close contact with, with the university. So we reach out to a lot of civil society, which is sort of how we complement also other activities at the university. So very quickly, uh, zo zo sort of zooming in on uh, our education here, these are some of the modules we teach. Um, this is the fall semester uh, last year, um, and it's everything, just to give you sort of an idea of, uh, you can't really see them there, but it's everything from evening, evening classes, like the first uh, module we had, to full-time studies at the undergraduate, uh, graduate, and PhD level. So we have sort of the whole spectrum in that sense. We don't, we're not responsible for any, what I've understood is called courses or master's programs, uh, but we do contribute to many master's programs at that, with specific modules that make, uh, make them more interdisciplinary. In a sense, um, I thought I'd show you since I was thinking I, it would have been nice to be able to bring uh, a 
one of my colleagues who's a bit hasn't been around the center as long as I have and is, has a different perspective on on sort of uh, working at CMS. But instead, I thought I'd show you this three minute um, video, uh, which is uh, actually made by one of our former colleagues and a master's student uh, when she did her um, uh, thesis on transforming economics education. Uh, specifically. And one of the modules that we teach is a, a, a module on uh, global economics and looking at economics from a very pluralist perspective, not uh, the, the traditional way of, of sort of, of mm -hmm. understanding economics. So this is just an example. So I thought I'd show this to you just to get a feeling for what other people might um, have to say about the experience of, of studying and working at our center. Um, so that's three minutes. Uh, here we go. CMS is a student-initiated and partially student-run um, university centre that's a, a meeting place for uh, researchers, students, uh, civil society, and the point is to get people to, to meet around some of the biggest issues facing humanity uh, at the moment. Uh, all of the courses, in fact, are run by uh, students or recently graduated students who uh, get the opportunity to construct a course around a theme um, and essentially invite experts in to talk about the, um, or to talk around the theme of the course. At the Global Economy course here at, at CMS, we try to give uh, students an introduction to economics, which explicitly tells them that there are uh, many different ways of doing economics and many different ways of looking at the economy itself. Uh, which you don't always find in a more introductory level uh, economics course in, in other, other institutions. Students are coming from various disciplines at different levels, from bachelor, master's, PhD levels. And the only thing they share is really this uh, craving to understand more about economics. Not, not understand more about the economics, but understand how the economy works. And that's where I realized that if you want to give them a fair understanding of how the economy works, you need uh, pluralism. For example, the course literature is so diverse and so wide, like the, the sources we get in touch with and all the perspectives we get mm -hmm. uh, on our plates is very eye-opening, um, not only to like the world around you, but yourself as well. It's also like the fact that it's interdisciplinary and everybody from different backgrounds and nationalities can take the course and connect yeah, so mm -hmm. many different things connect yeah. with other people but also like aspects of society yeah. and of the world psychologist Carl Rogers said uh, the only type of uh, knowledge that influences behavior uh, in a significant way is self-appropriated self-acquired knowledge and this is one of the reasons we try to uh, get students as involved in possible in constructing uh, their own learning experience or their own journey through through knowledge uh, over a course. It turns the classroom into a, a very creative space and uh, very it's very engaging as a student. I think yeah. like you can be creative in a classroom. It's not just about like listening to someone who knows best or better mm -hmm. than you. It's very stimulating and motivating to yeah. like, to be part of it and to like don't just sit in a classroom and digest that they can want to say yeah. but really see what you can contribute and, and it's it's wild it's yeah. experimental and it's i think it's <laughs> it's amazing I, I, yes that was a very brief yes yeah. quite a par uh, parallel with the post-crash economic society here Exactly. Actually, uh, Ingrid, who made the movie, she was inter she was following them as well. So mm -hmm. she, she, if you want to watch the whole movie, it's online. It's called Oikonomos. So she followed in different initiatives in, in the UK and in France and in Sweden as well. So the first part of the movie was the sort of critique of what's currently being done. And this is a part of the later part about sort of different examples of things uh, happening around Europe that are maybe a bit more in the direction that, that some students want to go. Yeah, it's very interesting. The similarities there. Um, so I want to go into detail here, but just to give you a little bit of an idea of how how um, we built this or this educational model has has evolved. 
uh, what we do is to run these modules that are interdisciplinary, we, we hire students on a project basis as coordinators and facilitators to plan, run, and evaluate each model. And this is on a module, this is on a nine, nine month project basis, and they work together in pairs. Um, and then we, they invite guest lecturers um, and different academics, different researchers, different practitioners to contribute to the, the content of the course. And depending on what's happening in the world or the, what, what the students said in the previous year, they adjust who comes in as well. So it's a bit uh, different in that sense. Um, and then there's a work group or a reference group, just as the first module uh, that we had in 1992 had as well, that support the, the, the coordinators with examination or assessment but also module development and decisions on what the content of form should take. So it's a sort of a critical friends. Um, and then of course the organization itself is, is, is hopefully somewhat of a collegial and democratic um, organization providing administrative, pedagogical and academic support to the, to the module coordinators in their daily work. Um, and then of course you can't forget the students and they are hopefully active participants in the modules uh, and coming from all sorts of different disciplines. And this. The modules they take for us are sort of complements to their more disciplinary backgrounds in a sense. So this is not replacing the disciplinary uh, studies or their degree programs. This is just a complement that they can take as an elective or bring into their education in different ways. Um, and then we have a, a vibrant student organization, of course, and, and students also contribute to, to the reference groups as well. And just to give uh, another student's impression of having taken the climate change leadership course at our center a few years ago, um, uh, she expressed that this was an excellent course and the best I've ever taken, but there's still room for improvement. Great to have this experience. And I think, I mean, the first part is great and it's great to get that sort of feedback. It makes you feel good. But what's more interesting is this idea that that, that fostering a, a culture that where students always are striving to sort of also be responsible for their own learning, not only being uh, consumers of knowledge, but also active participants. And I think these are the kind of people uh, that have these sort of uh, these sort of ideas that well, what what could we do better that we try to recruit to to be module coordinators at the head as well, and also sometimes we recruit people that are very critical of the way we do things as well, which I think is you know is interesting once they come in and then they actually do things differently, so the organization changes. Um, I won't have time to uh, go into this uh, in detail, unfortunately. Uh, this is I've noticed when I've, I've spoken about this before, also in the UK context that it's sometimes a bit hard to sort of think about this example and then think about how that relates to your own practice or the own sort of context that you're in. So if we had more time, I would have had a workshop in a more in a different kind of setting where uh, I could tell you a little bit more about the different examples that are specific examples of things happening in our organization or in our modules or ways that we do things, because that sometimes helps to sort of unpick the, the big, the big uh, uh, the sort of concept of, of, the, of the center that, that has evolved in Uppsala and also makes it easier to sort of apply in different contexts. So I won't talk about this, but I, what I will do is I'll flash through the examples for about five seconds each. Uh, and then you can just read them. And if there's one or two of them that really is sort of uh, uh, to you is really interesting, I'm happy to talk about with you afterwards. Or if there's time in the Q&A, we can go back to them as well. So I'll just sort of flash through them. And hopefully the titles and the pictures to say something about what I would have said. So for the last um, part of this talk, the next seven minutes, hopefully, um, five minutes, uh, I'll, I'll try to rush through this a bit. There's a lot of uh, research that's been done on, on this idea of student-faculty partnership, and I don't think I'll have time to go through the models, modules but um, and these sort of schematics that have been done, but I'm happy to give you the references later. Quite a lot of it's coming out of the UK, actually, interestingly enough. Um, 
this idea of, of student participation in curriculum design and this ladder, I don't, I don't think it's completely helpful where you have students completely in control of the curriculum here and here they're just sort of passive recipients. I think that's a bit one dimensional in some sense. I think uh, Dun Zanstra's uh, um, um, schematic here from 2011 is a little bit more helpful where you uh, sort of distinguish between the idea of emphasizing uh, student voice and representation on boards and whatnot and the idea of emphasis on students' actual engagement in, in different various processes as active participants, uh, not just as, as a student voice. And also the differences between when the students drive something and when the institution itself drives something. And this actually has consequences for what kinds of partnerships are created and are not created, and who, who participates and who doesn't participate, and in which way they participate. So happy to discuss that more if you're interested. And this, I think, is specifically interesting, perhaps also in, in connection to the ongoing uh, discussions in the UK. Also, I've, I've heard that there's quite a few discussions on how, this, the role of the student in assessing, you know, the quality of higher education and, and, and even an office of students has been created, if I'm, if I'm correct, which I don't know very much about, but it sounds a bit scary to me. Um, but maybe it's a great thing, I'm not sure. Um, but this quote is interesting because I think what they say here is that there's a subtle but extremely important difference between an institution that listens to students and responds accordingly and an institution that gives students the opportunity to explore areas that they believe to be significant, to recommend solutions and to bring about the required changes. The concept of listening to the student voice implicitly, if not deliberately, supports the perspective of student as consumer, whereas students as change agents explicitly supports the view of the student as active collaborator and co-producer with the potential for transformation. And it's interesting, in Uppsala University, we've actually had this initiative where we've tried to take the learning that we've had within a very interdisciplinary context and work with students and faculty from more disciplinary contexts in developing their teaching and learning. Um, so this was a project funded by a vice chancellor uh, back in 2013 for two years, and it's now led to sort of a institutionalization of the idea of students as partners in curriculum development and also the development of academic teaching and learning. And there's a whole website with, with all sorts of examples and different sorts of references on there that might be interesting for you. Uh, so check it out. It's in English as well, it's Swedish. So the last part here, which I'll buzz through is, uh, so then thinking about the role of the universities, which, where we started as well, the purpose of the university, not least in relationship to the challenges we're faced uh, with today. I thought I'd just end up with, uh, with a few slides here. And, um, Professor Carrie Facer from the University of Bristol. She's a professor of educational and social futures. She's attempted to um, try to rethink what the university is in, in, in the year 2018 and try to sort of put this into uh, five pillars actually, and which uh, you can agree or disagree with. I think it's a bit interesting, at least the way she phrases them. I won't have time to talk about each one, but I'll show them to you here. And the first one she talks about is the idea of disciplinarity actually not interdisciplinary, but disciplinarity. And the way that she defines that is developing students and researchers' capacity to develop procedures by which to judge new knowledge. We talked about stewardship, the idea that we also have to have a sort of some form of ethical approach to thinking about what is the implication of our, of our activities as a university. Um, we have to bring in reflexivity or critical thinking, as was mentioned before. What are the assumptions and beliefs that are forming our visions of the future? And we also, another thing that we do is, is modeling how do different forces interact to create new conditions. And experimentation is probably something we do as well. And what she says, then goes on to say in, in, in this uh, talk that she gave at our university, but also in some of her writing, is that if you have one without the other, sometimes it becomes quite problematic. But if you combine these two, these, these different these different qualities of a university, they're, it's actually quite powerful. It could actually be quite, um, uh, you know, a force for good. Uh, there's other more critical uh, scholars like Vanessa Andriotti from, from the University of British Columbia, who's a critical education scholar. She's talked about, well, what if our institutions that are reproducing some of the problems that we're trying to address with our research and education are actually part of the problem, more power, part of the problem than the solution, and that some institutions and some ways of doing things are maybe perhaps beyond reform. So what do we do with that information? And that's she goes into that in this paper, which I think is really interesting, uh, called Mapping Interpretations of Decolonization in the Context of Higher Education. Um, let's see here. I think I will just end with this. And I think this is an interesting example. So not ended with the future CMS, which I was going to talk about, but I won't have time for that. But I'll, I'll mention this. Uh, I had a chat with my friend from Cairo um, uh, just last week, who is a young man who was part of the Arab Spring. Um, 
movement and, and you know had a lot of hope for the future and the future of their country. Now he's finding himself um, more or less in a situation of a military dictatorship and having started what he calls a, a micro university or a pigeon tower instead of a, an ivory tower, uh, working with uh, uh, with learning in a context which is uh, of course highly authoritarian and under a military dictatorship. He's trying to rethink what the university and bring back the original idea of the university and what the scholarship actually is under those sort of conditions. So I think in thinking about also where we're going in, in, in Uppsala and, and what we're doing and what we're not doing, I, I find it very inspirational to think about what other people are able to do with much, much more constraints, both economic, political uh, uh, constraints that, that you know, we find ourselves in. Um, of course, we have huge issues as well all the time trying to work in disciplinary ways, but I think uh, the, the thing they're doing in Cairo is, is really impressive, so I recommend you check that out if you want to have a different type of idea of what a university could be as well, in a very different cultural context. I won't talk about the future of CMS. Um, I was going to have time to talk about how CMS uh, also, um, I think in different ways, has contributed to social change, to societal change in Sweden uh, through the 25 years of its activities, uh, but there's not been much research on this, so it would be more informed guessing than, than any, any sort of uh, work there. That means that it's, time is up. Um, sorry about that. No worries. I have some, uh, let's take some questions now and have a conversation. Um, but uh, I also have a book and a few other things that is, you know, information about students. And I think there's some here at the Tyndall Center as well. So if people are interested to learn more and, and more have more literature, happy to share that. Or the Tyndall Center, I hope, is happy to share that with you as well. So thanks for your attention and happy to take questions and discussions. Yeah. And that's, uh, thanks for listening. To you. Thank you very much, Isaac, and uh, yeah, I can go. Yes, um, <coughs> then might I ask that you introduce yourself uh, very, very briefly. Well, um, he's moving. I'm very interested in talking, Isaac. What it reminds me of is 1968. Hmm. Do you remember 1968? I wasn't alive then. No, but do you remember the story? Do you remember what happened in 1968? Yes. The student, um, yeah. the student uprising in mm. Paris, Sorbonne, and around Europe. Mm. And many of the ideas that you put forward today were actually put forward in 1968 yeah. in the student assemblies about um, participative learning mm. and collaborative learning, mm. students being involved in the, um, mm. in their planning their courses mm. and the critique of the examination system, the critique of the mm. university system, the way it's mm. hierarchical, hierarchically um, structured, mm. authoritarian systems, very little student participation. So many of the ideas you're putting forward at seamless mm. <coughs> really go back in that long tradition, back in 68 mm. and forwards, very much of a libertarian education tradition. Yeah. That's also not just in the universities, but also in the high schools as well. Mm. The libertarian critiques of mm. the, the structures of high schools. You mentioned high schools here. Yeah. Mm. I think that the, the um, collaborative project you're talking about equally as an equally applies to high schools as it does to universities. Yeah. And it's an absolutely true. Very interesting. Yeah. So just on that point, I think it's really interesting to think about, well, I wasn't around in 1960. No, I obviously, I was, I was, I wasn't even uh, thought of, uh, but I think What's interesting, maybe, maybe what's a little bit different with, with our story and what we're doing now, first of all, it's at a very different scale, and it, didn't, it hasn't in some sense. I was going to talk about that, but it's starting to now, you know, other students that have been to our center are starting to try to do th similar things within their own institutions, yeah. often meeting a lot of resistance, not able to sort of put this through. Uh, but I think what's, what is interesting, I guess, with Simus is that it has survived for 25 years, and that it's a 25-year project that is still going on, and that in some sense, even though I'm very critical of our university a lot of times, uh, it's. I still sort of see that there's there's something about an institution that lets something like same exist for that long and to con con continue to support it. Of course, they could miss. They could take advantage of us and use it as an excuse to, to not do other things, which we try to be careful not to do. But it's, there's still that element of allowing an institution that's actually critical of the institution itself to to continue for that long. So, so but it's it's a fine balance to to strike. I think. Does the, have, does the management have to be effectively involved in what I might describe as directed evolution? If they are or if they... Well, yeah. in terms of managing this process of, of, of this evolution as it transforms with these new ideas that come in. Mm. I mean, it, with, with the Cairo thing, yeah. um, um, that sort of shades of neoliberalism and the, mm -hmm. uh, um, the economics of it was called. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's sort of all related that there's this sort of power 
palace, you've got this structure that's managing things and keeping yeah. everything in place, yeah. and then you've got this change coming along, yeah. and you've got the change of the outside world coming along, and, and um, what we're going to do about it, and, and how much do we want to do about it, and how much is uncomfortable, and how much is comfortable. Yeah. And, I think, uh, I mean, in some sense, one of the things I think, from my experience at least, what has been really positive is the is a sort of intergenerational aspect of what we've been doing. And that actually, that it wasn't just students starting this and, and, and sort of putting this in place, but there was a need for this from researchers and from professors that were just tired of, of, their, of the way things had been, had been sort of working within their departments. So I think it was, we strike sort of at the time in 1992, when this happened, there was a lot of sort of interest from faculty and that's sort of kept on, it's gone up and down a bit. And of course, there's a difference between faculty and university administrators as well. And I think we've had the luck to have had supportive administrators uh, as well and find those people that can be creative also administratively to make something like this work. And I think without them, we would have probably, you know, uh, not been around uh, any longer. So I think it, it, there is there's a form of management. I think also I, I, I've ended up in a position where I'm constantly uh, translating and, 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 and also trying to maintain this, this balance between um, uh, pleasing the the vice chancellors and their and, and their interests and also critiquing them at the same time and we have a lot of our students i mean they go out and protest they have they're really active in the divestment movement so they they they're, they're knocking on our vice chancellor's door every day at the same time we have other students that are working with the sort of pedagogical projects that i was saying before that are actually working with the institution so we're working against it and with it <laughs> to be a relevant institution you need to keep up with the changes and challenges of the world don't you? And, yeah and, and, and research and everything new that's coming in and that's part of universities I yeah. suppose. Yes, I, guess it's the way, it's, I guess it's also the way in, in which you do that. So. Yeah. yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, Chris, Chris, and then what's up? I was pick up on the, the with mm -hmm. care bit. Um, just wondering because you kind of alluded to like previous like, learning culture has been an important factor potentially in how this can be implemented. Um, to what extent does it vary from cohort to cohort? Um, you have quite a diverse cohort. Um, and does the background of the students have any bearing on how how the process is implemented? Um, and if if so, how is it how do you adapt it to um, deal with any any issues that are tomorrow? I think it has in some sense, but I think also because we hire students before they're completely disciplined. They're they're a bit undisciplined, and also uh, so there is this element. And I haven't. I mean, there's been a bit of uh, research on our on our center and the activities that we do. It's just coming out now. Also, quite a bit of it's run by former students of ours, also looking at our practices and so forth, which is quite interesting to be reading as well. So I think a lot of times um, the processes and the things that are, that happen in our center are quite emergent and quite complex in, in some sense. And I think, of course, disciplinary backgrounds affects. The way in which students perceive, I mean, it affects their obviously their 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 view of the world and the, uh, the epistemology or the ontology that they have, and that affects obviously the way that they design courses. But there's all these sort of checks and balances in the process as well, and we also have this environment that is also, in a sense, um, and this could have to do with the fact that we don't have a strong research environment that is not forced to establish and sort of establish their territory and to create their theories that they have to sort of have. So we we we're much more focused on learning. And, and creating platforms to learn about issues than than uh, than creating uh, research careers. Uh, so, that, but that also has its background because, or its, its backside because people like myself and others, there's nowhere really for us to go if we want to go somewhere else within our university. Once we came to this center, that's it's hard for us to sort of uh, establish ourselves because the university is so so siloed. So you have to be associated with the research group that usually is quite disciplinary, uh, unfortunately. So I mean, there's there's all sorts of issues we could discuss there, but I think. In a sense, I think it does have a bearing on the education. Just that's my guess, but it, not to an extent that it would. That it, I mean, it can sometimes students that we hire become. There are issues, of course, at times, and when students that we hire can't work together, for example, because they have a completely different view on how something should be done, and they could they're just discussing for three months in the planning phase whether to have this lecture or this lecture. I mean, that has happened, and then we have to sort of intervene and maybe shift things around and so forth. But it, it happens surprisingly a few times. So. My question is about how you ensure continuity, because I've so often encountered initiatives, maybe on a small scale, where 
they depend on, on the commitment of a, of a core group of students or mm. a key member of staff who supports it. Mm. Yeah. And then some of those people go and you end up with a hiatus and then you may be reinvigorated with a new group, but they have a completely different set of ideas and mm. it loses its direction, mm. loses its way very quickly. But you've managed to keep this going for 20 years, 20 yeah. plus years. Mm. How do you ensure that kind of community uh, continuity? I think um, I think the uh, hard a lot of hard work, <laughs> and I think yeah a lot of that that you know these I think there's a sense of um, um, I don't know I think there's a sense of actually it's, it's like people that are the work at our center and so forth and different they end up in different places some of them end up in academia some of them end up in politics some of them end up in you know the, the moving out to a little cabin in the woods some people end up becoming rock stars. I mean, it's, it's very sort of, they've gone different, different directions, but I think in a sense, they, there's still that sense of community and sort of having been part of, of, of something that's bigger than themselves in a sense. So I think that that's sort of something that, that it maintains and that that's also specifically with the one internally, I think, which is probably the most important part in terms of our survival. There's been people that have, uh, you know, gone on, gotten PhDs, gotten research careers, established themselves within different disciplines at the university and then are our sort of, um, you know, they, they, they care about our center and they, they contribute. But it's not, a lot of times those people are actually not keen to get involved in university politics. So that's a problem we've faced over the last 10 years is that on the university boards and the boards that make decisions over our heads, there's not always, a, a, there's a acknowledgement that we do something interesting and that it's it, it's something that's, you know, a, a value. They realize that, but not perhaps why and, and, and not, they don't maybe share the same sort of idea of education and so forth. So that's that's been a struggle over the last five years, those uh, those sort of uh, reorganization processes that just take the, the sort of the life out of you, especially if you have a position like mine and try to sort of focus on the issues that are happening in the world and at the same time you're just struggling with sort of day-to-day -day things. So I think it's taken a lot of sort of people that are willing to commit time to, to dealing with those uh, those frictions that have arisen naturally because we do things across the grain rather than with the grain. So Sorry, we have a. Oh, is it okay? Yeah. Just have a. Yeah. Not me. Like. Oh, my company, Planet Hydrogen. Is there a danger, and you might have thought of this, in giving students so much responsibility that when the time comes to spot that some of their fellow students are simply falling behind and shouldn't really be there, mm. they're going to feel pretty uneasy at deciding whether they should continue in the course or not? Mm. After all, you've given them responsibility. Mm. Where does the balance lie there? Yeah, I think most students that we engage in this coordination role, which is not a teaching role, it's important to say, it's a sort of non-expert role in a sense. Uh, it's, a, it's a role that facilitates learning rather than a sort of more, less of a transmissive mode and more of a, of a mode of, of, of interaction. Of course, we have traditional lectures as well, and, and they come in and have, just like we're doing now, have somebody speak and then there's a Q&A. Uh, but I think um, that, I think it's, I mean, each, each, um, the students that we hire, I mean, the first time they're hired, they're given more support. And there's a person like myself or others that are part of the core team of the organization that are sort of a, a sounding board and a, and a resource person that meets up with them once a week or so and discusses sort of almost like a supervision sort of role. And if they have problems, then then we deal with that. But we also have various processes of, of ensuring both I guess continuity, which was mentioned before, this idea of how do we how do we bring continuity so that there's very um, detailed reports that are written after each module is run so that they that they take uh, into um, into consideration when they're designing the next year's module. Often, one of the students that we have working with the module is keep, keeps working the next year, and then we bring in one person that's new. So it's sort of this this that's an, also a, a way of sort of bringing this in. So it is sort of in the beginning, I think it's a little bit overwhelming, and it, and some I mean we do. We fail a lot, but I think also we have to learn how to accept that we fail sometimes as well and deal with those consequences as well, not least in trying to just climate change and other sort of issues. So I think there's a sort of a parallel to that as well in the process. I don't know if that answered your question completely, but I think I think this is not, I mean, it's sometimes when you talk about this, I, I sort of I sort of pinch myself and hit myself for just presenting something that is, you know, quite innovative and unique and interesting and so forth. It's sometimes it's much more interesting to talk about the difficulties and the sort of the things that we're not so good at and so forth. So I'm gonna to try to do that maybe much more up ahead because I think we have issues all the time, of course, as well. There are there are problems with this model of education as well, just as there are problems with the way that we do things now. So I think, uh, but I think what's 
interesting about this, it, it really wake, it shakes people up a bit, both our students and the people that get this chance to coordinate a module, but also the lectures that come in. I mean, they, you know, they change their way of teaching after having taught in the module at our center. So they go back to their departments and start doing things in different ways, starting new master programs that are inspired by some of the questions of the students to them when they, when they come to us. So I think it's sort of this, this idea of that, that uh, creating those sort of spaces where, where things that we can't really manage perhaps can still happen and, and where we can start thinking about things in new ways. So we've got five minutes left and we have a couple of questions uh, uh, from the front. And then if, is it okay if we have the questions asked and then um, you notes. can answer yeah. them and then um, you can then sort of wrap up your talk. Yeah. So Susan, you go first. Yeah. Susan, you go first. Yeah. Oh, um, so thank you very much. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, um, at, at this university, we have something called the University College of Interdisciplinary Learning. Mm. And that has been casting around for ways of doing things which are innovative, but also useful. And at the moment, they're thinking about what a sustainability course might look like. And I think this offers a potentially very useful model for doing that. I can, as I'm playing it out and thinking through the operate. Oper operational aspect of this I'm seeing all sorts of potential issues because yeah. people are quite entrenched in their different in silos I think you mentioned it but I think this is very interesting uh, in, in, um, as, a, as a potential model mm. um, you mentioned um, communities from outside mm. informing what's going on in the university and I wonder if you could say just a little bit more about how the, about how that happens and what sure. the dynamics of that. So on the first point, I'm happy to sort of continue the conversation and, and think about it because we have quite a few universities that, uh, that actually reach out to us quite often and ask these sort of questions. So we've started developing a capacity to mm. be sounding boards <laughs> for those sort of ideas. And, and it plays out very differently depending on the institutional context. So I'm happy to talk about that. Mm. Uh, could, could I just, sorry to interrupt, I'll just say that um, if, if people need to leave now, um, feel free, please, because, you know, the, the time of the seminar is, and I understand that some of you need to go back to your offices or desks, so, yeah, sorry. Should I take in more questions or should I take uh, No, there's one more question. And then, yeah, I can take both of those. I'm one of those uh, people from outside. In fact, I can see several in the room from outside. Um, Lydia Merrill and... I'm interested to know whether you think the effectiveness in terms of the learning that those young women were so sparky about was down to the fact that the whole way of doing things is transgressive in an institution that is siloed and structured by the economics of outputs and papers and, and um, how far you've been able to research what you what you mean by successful things? Mm. What, what is it that you you feel you that they feel they've succeeded in doing when they've gone out and become a professor or live in a hut? You know what what is it, and how do you garner that? How do you use that yourself mm. as evidence? Mm. Okay, so I'll answer the first question first, and then I'll take your question. So I think. From the beginning, Seamus was established the idea of being a meeting place, not only within the university, but with, with, with society was, was sort of part of the original idea and also having physical spaces where that's possible. Um, this has taken various forms over the 25 years and I've only been involved for, actually now I've been involved for half of its life, so it's 12 years now. Um, and and um, we have public events every week, more or less, sort of like this. In different ways when people come to talk to our students and so forth we often sort of invite the public in to that so we have approximately 50 to 60 yeah. public events in different forms both lecture formats workshop formats and so forth sometimes we do it on our own sometimes we work with different institutions including artistic uh, institutions and and you know civil society organizations uh the municipality uh, and and a whole plethora of different actors and in, in putting those together one interesting thing that we've uh done for the last two years which i was going to talk to if i talk about if i had time was something we call the Uppsala collaboratory which is sort of an extension of the the idea of a meeting place and uh, it was part of the eu funded project for two years and now it's becoming more institutionalized as a physical meeting place uh, in the center of Uppsala, 
because we've been sort of moved out towards the campus area more and the camp is this sort of campus vacation going on. So we managed to sort of bring back a space within the center of Uppsala and trying, and it's in the, it's in the old public library. So it's an old public space and it's now been taken over by the university. So it's the Department of Government that has taken over it. And we were given within this EU project the possibility of creating a, a meeting place and a sort of a modern agora, you could say, to and a hub to discuss regional sustainable development and bringing, so turning the university inside out a little bit and saying that, well, the university should, and the sort of things that we're doing here should be much more accessible to people and citizens of the region. And they should also be able to take this space over. So it's not only the university reaching out and creating events and public events, but it's actually different citizens and actors that can come in and say, I'm interested in this, and I wanna do this as a part of my organizational work or whatever. So this space, uh, we have a website called the Uppsala Collaboratory uh, .se, um, and that's been really success. That's been really interesting, actually, because it's 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 led to all sorts of new meetings and actors coming together, and and also creating a sort of a physical friction because a lot of our times nowadays, I mean, we're spending our times on computers and in the digital world, and we don't actually get to meet people that have very opposing uh, views on things and also opposing backgrounds. So that's what we've tried to play with with this initiative. So that's one initiative and in how we work with this. And in terms of sort of judging the success, I think since we're not a sort of research institution, we've, um, we tend to do things more than, than uh, under, understand them sometimes, I think. And that's, that's been one of our um, problems, I would say, in some sense. Uh, and in some sense, I think that grows out of the idea of this, this frustration with how slow things are moving and how much needs to be done. But I think also we've built into the, at least into the educational process, ways of reflexively thinking about our practice and actually having a sort of scholarly or research lens on, on ourselves and constantly constantly thinking about what we're doing and how we're doing it and thinking about the relationship to, to different ideas of social change or different ideas of learning and so forth. So we have different um, um, processes that we put in place within, within our organization to do that. But it's just actually the last five years or so that more and more um, research has been coming out about the sort of things that we're doing and also trying to research ourselves, but also having others also thinking about the sort of things that we do in relationship to what is happening in other, in other contexts. So I, I'm happy to sort of share some of the, uh, if you give me, if you send me an email, I can, I can, I can send you some of the, the papers that have been coming out late, lately, specifically on this idea of, of sort of understanding the student experience, but not and also specifically the role of a module coordinator. So we're, that's been sort of the focus of the research over the last few years from some of my colleagues. But we still need to understand much more from other sorts of perspectives, so from the sort of faculty level, what, what are they experiencing? What, how do they perceive what we're doing? And how do they judge what we're doing? And how does the students themselves taking the courses understand this and, and what it means for them? And also actors outside of the university, how do they perceive our, our activities? And how do they make use of sort of the things that we that we uh, try to initiate uh, the spaces that we create. So yeah, much more research needs to be done, but then a lot of, we need to take action as well. So good combination of the two, I think it's, it's always good. Okay, oh, um, so I think that sort of uh, wraps it up for, for us. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's great having you here. And uh, thanks again, Isak, for yeah. your um, really very interesting talk. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, our next, uh, seminar is in February, our, and our speaker, um, sorry, <laughs> mind block. Um, our speaker next uh, month is Professor Chris Priest, uh, Chris Priest from Bristol University. Oh. Sorry, sorry about that mind block here. Uh, so, um, and that would be on the third week of February uh, uh, at the same time and be the same place. So, I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again. Thank you.